Hi everyone. Welcome to this uh, masterclass with Fi Ambo. We just decided we have a very big uh, corona distance <laughs> between each other. But that's the only distance I feel to Fi really because I've known and followed Fi's work for many, many years and I never get tired of he hearing her talk about film, art, life. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank for you for taking me. the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, as you can see in the title, we call the film activism and activism is a part of your work. But when we talked the other week, it's, we're going to focus on art mm -hmm. because it is activism, but it's art. Mm -hmm. Art is your mm -hmm. focus, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but you also, I just want to mention that as well. So filmmaker, artist, activist, now also at the Danish Arts Foundation Council. Arts Council. I, and what's I your title in English, do you know? Mm, chairperson of the board. Chairperson of the board for film. Also for the whole board. Actually. For the whole board. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I came in because important person. There was a there was a Me Too scandal, and I <laughs> took the. Yeah. They the brought position. in a woman, and she changed the word from chairman to chairperson. I think. Yeah. Something like that, mm. right? It was already changed al already actually. But okay. Uh, yeah, which is kind of ironic, but let's not go further into that. <laughs> we will not talk more about that. We'll talk about art and Fee's films. That's the plan here. <coughs> Um, so, as you might have seen in the catalogue, three of Fee's films are shown here in the festival. Uh, one was shown this morning, Mechanical Love. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow you can see Fee's latest film called 7030. And uh, on Tuesday you can see, um, is it called When You Look Away in English yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah. When You Look Away. So, so keep that in mind. And the rest, not the rest of her films, but quite a number of the rest of Fee's body of work, we will show clips from during the seminar. So mm -hmm. we will not show clips from the films that are shown here in the festival, because then you can, see, you can see them in the cinema, but we'll show some other things. And uh, even though we might not go totally chronological, but we will be slightly chronological, mm -hmm. because there's kind of an, you know, there's, there's a journey in your films. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes sense to, in a way, start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, when Fee and I talked the other day, I just want to give you some highlights from our conversation. We came, we, Fee said words like artistic obligation, demanding something of your audience, creating room for interpretation, sustainability as a working method. And those will be some of the things we'll talk about mm -hmm. here today. But we also talked about, I asked Fee, what inspires you? Um, what kind of films do you like? And uh, for, Fee mentioned right away two Finnish films. And I thought it was interesting, so we, I decided that we should start this, this seminar with showing a few minutes from a Finnish film. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Virpi Sutari made a wonderful film called Garden Lovers mm -hmm. a few years ago. And let's see the, the, the first clip, please, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. No, tänne tuoksuu jo magnolia. Joo. Ne on kyllä. Ne on kyllä. Tämä on fantastinen tuoksu. Niin, tämä. se on Tosi sääli, pehmi. kun mä en sitä tunne. Mä en todella tunne. Mm. Katsopa tuonne kukan sisällekin, niin siellä on tuommoinen aika jännä niin on, rakennelma joo. kaiken kyllä. kaikkiaan. Että ei tee tuommoinen... En... Mulla on tässä niin harvoja ampia, siitä on muita käy, vaikka nämä hieno tuoksu tässä on. Niin, ei ne oikein taida tätä osata arvostaa. Ja mä olin tässä ollut kymmenen vuotta ja niin töissä ja me myin firmat pois, niin tuli semmoinen tunne, että tässä nyt ei ihan koko elämä kannata olla yksi ja laitoin lehteen ilmoituksen, että kiinnostunut puutarhanhoidosta, urheilusta ja Taiteesta. Taiteesta myöskin. No, vastauksia tuli 104 kappaletta ja sitten mä aloitin systeemille, että miten lähdetään, lähdetään lännestä niin kuin itään päin ja suunnitelma oli, että kolme päivässä vähintään niin käydään läpi. Kun tämä oli 98 tämä numero se ja sitten oli vielä kuusi jäljellä. Kävin kaikki läpi ja sitten Päädyin tähän seijaan valitettavasti. No, no, no. <laughs> Sophie, what is it about Finnish filmmaking? I mean, you mentioned Peter Honkasalo. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Virpi Sutari. Could you say a few words about how you're inspired by them? Yeah, well, in the beginning, when I started making films, it was uh, a lot of reportage. 
you know, that was the, the more dominant genre. So for me to see these artistic films where the photographer had a, a framing and a plan and that it is sort of, uh, it's staged, but at the same time it's, uh, it's alive, I thought was so inspiring because it's so much the director's view on the world that it's so obvious that there's a subjective storyteller behind this. And, and, and that was sort of, um, it was new to me because I, I hadn't been exposed to a lot of that. Uh, so, so to me, these uh, Finnish directors were just uh, really an eye-opener. Mm. Also, Pierre Hankasalo, who's like a ninja uh, photographer, <laughs> cinematographer, because she shoots so little and it's, it's so much of her footage that gets into the film. But I'm guessing that it's difficult to find her films because they are on 35 millimeters and I'm not sure that she has the rights to her films, so maybe they were not uh, digitalized. That's something that's really, um, yeah, difficult if yeah. you don't have the right no, to. That's true, film. it was very yeah. difficult yeah. to find it. But uh, this one has sort of the, the, the feeling of a Finnish <coughs> film, doesn't yeah, it? Definitely. With, with yeah, definitely. With the tone and the... Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the sense of humor and also that, that the audience can sort of read things into it. It's mm. not explained what they need to experience here. It's just a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's just a, a very subjective and artistic genre that I like a lot. Mm. Sophie, you, uh, you actually made your first film, which was a huge success, won the main award in Eat Fun and Everything, why you still were in film school. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe we should start by seeing the, a clip from that one, yep. and we can talk about what that meant and what happened after that, basically. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention that, that it, it's a, it, we'll see the beginning of the film, which is called Family. There are no English subtitles on, but it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's more to show the tone of the film mm -hmm. and some vis the visual language you chose mm -hmm. to use. Mm -hmm. So let's see, it's, we're gonna see the beginning of the film family, mm -hmm. and then we can talk a bit afterwards. Yeah. for a meget kort tid siden der. Ej, hvor dårligt altså. Ikke? Jeg vil gøre det her i fire år, ikke? og op til 27 grader i dag køligere dog ved kyster med pålandsvind. Men teologerne lover, at sommervejret fortsætter i hvert fald mandag og tirsdag, og det bliver op til 27 grader. Med den udsigt slutter radioavisen. Det er 60 grader. Jeg er ønsket at gå på stranden. Du skal på folkeregistret. Nej, jeg er selv... Nej, jeg er på folkeregistret. Nej, men det kunne, det kunne du have gjort, hvis vi havde stået tidligere op, så havde det taget en time, og så kunne du gå på stranden resten af dagen. Ja, men jeg var super deprimeret i går, og jeg har været super deprimeret i dag, og hvis jeg fortsætter med det her, så ved jeg erfaring, at så får jeg det meget, siger, meget dårligt. Jeg siger, du vil gøre nogle af de ting, der fælder om, for eksempel... Og hvad er det? Altså, for eksempel siger du i går... Du siger jeg... aldrig nogen behagelige ting. Jeg kan mærke, at det kun er dårlige ting. Du siger Nej. ikke... Sæt dig ned og spise en soft ice. Nu kører vi en tur på landet, og har det rigtig ikke. godt. Det der ting kommer jo som reaktion på noget andet. Ved du hvad, skat? Det er dig, der har besluttet dig for, at du vil lave den her film. Det er ikke mig, vel? Nej, og, det... og det er en ubehagelig ting, at skulle lave ja. for dig. Så hvis du, lømme, hvis du vil forsere mig i ubehagelig situation, ikke? Jeg vil ikke forsere dig i nogen ubehagelig situation. Så vil jeg også respekt, for jeg puster ud. Jeg beder dig om at gå i gang med nu, og prøve på at opspore den far, for det kan godt tage lang tid. Det kan jeg skal på stranden nu. Det er også langt bedre. Men så bare for ikke tage en telefon med derud. Hvorfor skal jeg sidde i min betonlejlighed? Hvor, hvorfor kan det ikke være en rar omgivelse, at jeg ringer til? Men du skal ikke ringe til folk, og giver sig til Behøver det være sådan, øh, jeg glæder efter min far? Behøver Nej, det være specielt? Skal... Det er ikke nogen big deal for mig. Eller? Nej, men Sammy, okay, hvis det ikke er nogen big deal for dig, hvorfor springer du så rundt på den der måde nu? Okay. 
Kan du, kan du ikke sige det præcis, som du siger mig, hvis du skal have hårdt med? Jo. Se. Ja. Ja. Er det din storebror? Min storebror. Hvis der havde været en far på det tidspunkt, så var han jo ikke død nu. Og min mor, hvad der er sket med hende? Var det forhold med til din mor, der kunne bruge også på dig? Har det altid været dårligt? Nej, det, da jeg var barn, var det godt nok. Jeg kan ikke huske det, fordi det er sådan fragmenter, ikke? Jeg er totalt grudt til, men det er ikke så gammel syv til året. Prøv at se et stort hår hernede. Må jeg se et andet billede? Den ligner dig her. Gør det? So, uh, co-directed with Sami Saif, we have yeah. to remember yeah. to say, yeah. which is also the main character. And apologies for not having the subtitles, but just to say this is the beginning of the film where we understand very quickly he's looking for his father, his brother committed suicide, his mother's also dead. So mm. you're basically following him and you, we hear Fee in the background yeah. talking about it. But maybe we can start by, I mean, you're in film school. This is 2001. It came out in 2001. 2001. I started in film school in 1999. So in the middle yeah. of when you're in film school, yeah. this ends up becoming a huge success. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about what that meant for you, I mean, in the mo that moment in your life of making a film like this? Well, actually, I wasn't allowed to make it while I was in film school. So we shot it in the first vacation I had from film school. We shot the whole film. Uh, and then I was sort of uh, being a bit secretive about it because we're not supposed to make films when we're in film school, outside film school. So uh, I sort of uh, snuck myself into the editing room and, <laughs> and stuff like that. But when it came out, it wasn't so much a secret anymore. So um, uh, I'm not sure exactly, beca because I don't know what it would have been like if I didn't make this film while I was in film school. But, but um, one thing that struck me was that it was sort of, it's actually easier to make a film outside film school than inside film school. <laughs> because, and how that? Yeah. because in film school, you, you have to take all these people into your editing room and you, you're listening to a lot of pe different people's opinions and you are in a fragile place. And, uh, and making a film outside film school was much more, you know, you get to decide what you want to do and you do it. So, yeah, in that way, it was, it was a good um, reminder to me that it, hadn't, it, it doesn't have to be that complicated to make films. <laughs> in, 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 a, in, in a Danish for sure, but in a European context, I would say it kind of redefined the way we saw documentaries. Mm. I mean, it became a huge success. Mm. It was launched, if I remember correctly, without saying it was a documentary. Yeah, it was in, in those days we were really scared that people would want to see it if it was a documentary, but they still didn't want to see it, even though <laughs> we didn't say it was a documentary. It didn't, it, it, in cinemas in Denmark, I think it sold maybe only 2,000 tickets or something like mm. that. Mm. But on festivals worldwide, it became a success. And also in Denmark at that time, people weren't used to going to the cinemas to see documentary films. It was sort of a dying genre. Mm. And the journalists, they didn't know how to talk about this. Uh, we got the worst reviews ever for this film in Danish newspapers. So it was, uh, it w it was um, kind of a surprise to us that mm. it actually hit. Uh, it, it was an international hit, but it definitely wasn't a Danish one. So I'm curious. Because, as you say, you, you do. I mean, you, you kind of just did it. And was was Sammy uh, finished with film school, or was he also in film school? No, he finished just before me. Before before okay. I entered. Yeah. But just to say, you, you you made it in a way that, well, as I say, we we might say reinvented it. But at least you kind of created almost a school, a way of making films with mm. the way you used the images, the way you played around with it, as you would do in a fiction film. Yeah. And you even worked with a fiction, or mostly fiction uh, editor, yeah, Jens Peter yeah, Jens. Yeah, and yeah. how did that come about? And how did that co I collaboration think it was work? I think it was important for Sammy to to put a distance to the film. So we 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 made it, and we just decided that in order to make sort of a sh a mix between a feature film and a video diary, we made this mix. So it was important to 
to make it into a feature-like film to keep the very personal story at a distance. So that was sort of what we were playing with, being extremely intimate without being personal. That was, in those days, that was the fine balance in a lot of films that came out that were a bit like that. So Same. it's, uh, yeah, that, that's, that was the discussion all the time. When is this personal and private and when is this something that, uh, that people would want to see? It's, it's, it's true and it's good to remind us of, you know, the time that has passed in mm. a way because we just talked about the other day that actually one of the films that defined the whole personal film mm -hmm wave, if you want, mm. was a Swedish film called Papa Oya, yeah. Father and I, which mm. was very intimate and, mm -hmm. and almost maybe for some people too personal. Yeah, yeah. So that was the beginning of that. And since then, we've seen a lot of personal films yeah, 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 yeah. that go very close. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so <coughs> what I think is interesting is because it just became such a, a defined moment for the rest of the business in a way, this, this film, and you're still in film school, did you feel that that kind of defined the way you wanted to make films forward? Or you, did you still feel you could develop your cinematic language freely after that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't think that this was defining anything because it was my first film. I hadn't finished any film before I made this film. So, and I, and I still feel that I'm sort of developing the way the language that I work w with um, so I didn't think it, it locked me up in any way. It, it sort of uh, opened my mind to that, uh, that there are different tastes around the world, that coming to Amsterdam was just um, amazing to see that there was this huge audience, that people knew the genre and that people could talk about it in a much more uh, sophisticated way than we did in Denmark at that time. So, so it, it opened my um, vision to, to working internationally instead of working only in Denmark because I felt that at that time the understanding of the genre was much more expanded outside Denmark. Hmm. So, so it gave me sort of a thirst to go into that market instead of staying in Denmark, which has for me actually been really um, defining for the way I make film ever since then. Even if I make films in Denmark with Danish characters, uh, it's always easier to explain to, yeah, to, to foreign investors what it, what it is than it's been to a lot of Danish TV stations. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> says something about the situation in Denmark, I'm afraid. So, so after film school, Fee, you, you, I mean, you continue in a way. I mean, as you said, you told me, you know, so this film was like following Sami mm -hmm. in his process, yeah. so basically letting the main character define the film, yeah. define the, the, mm -hmm. the journey. Mm -hmm. And the next film you make is is also, you know, going after a very famous Danish yeah. director yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. In, in the film Gambler. Yeah. And, but then you chose something totally different. Yeah. What happened after that? Well, then I, I made the film Mechanical Love, and I think that, that when I made that film, that's a thematic film that investigates what is an emotion, and is it different if you are directing it towards something that's mechanical, um, or if you direct it towards something that's flesh and blood, human or an animal. Uh, I wanted to, to dig into that subject and it was really liberating to me to see that you can make films out of a theme and then you can have different characters so you're not that much dependent on one character because that's a vulnerable way to make films. Sometimes that character doesn't want to be in the film anymore. So in, when, if you sort of um, take more control over the film by, by choosing a theme and then you can choose different characters that can sort of um, cross uh, that can cross fruition. How, what's the word in English? Cross fertilize. I think cross fertilize yeah. each other in, yeah. in, in, in a different way mm. than when you just have one main character and the world around that character. Mm. So to me, that was sort of a, a, a much more fun way of working, and I and I did that in several films after that. Mm. But it's interesting because when you see, when you come to Mechanical Love, it feels like that's the start of the journey. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and we can get back to that later, mm -hmm. maybe, mm -hmm. if, if one film brings the next one, or if there's yeah. like, you know, if, if, the, if, yeah. if they all point in one direction to yeah, the, yeah. To the yeah. final yeah. film, uh, who knows. But, but so this was the first time that you like, like chose theme over mm. character, yeah. in a way. Mm. And then you continue with that in Free, Free the, the Mind. mind. Yeah. And are they connected thematically somehow? Yeah. They would, right? Could you explain? Yeah. yeah, so Mechanical Love, when I made that film, there was a, this one scene where at a, at a nursing home, some scientists put these EEG uh, things on the head of the, of the people in the nursing home to see what happens in their brain when they cuddle a robot seal. And, and I just realized that this, this film is not 
this is only scratching the surface because I'm, tr I'm trying to look at what is an emotion, but, but really what is a thought? And I, and I couldn't put everything into this film, so I decided in order to not stress out about putting everything into one film that I wanted to make three films. So one was, was about looking at robots to investigate what is an emotion, and the next one would be what is, what is, a, what is a thought and how can we see that in the human brain? And then I made Free the Mind. And the last one is what is consciousness? Who is having this thought and this emotion? What is consciousness? And does it exist inside our body or is consciousness also something that can exist outside our bodies? And that was the, definitely the most difficult film to make ever. <laughs> and that's called When You Look Away. And that's the one that's going to be screened yeah. on Tuesday. So yeah. it's, it's a trilogy. The three films are connected. So, so yeah, so, so me uh, Mechanical Love was shown this morning. Um, we're going to see a clip yeah. in a moment from mm -hmm. Free the Mind. Okay. But before we do that, could you give us some insight into how, you, I mean, because you, you, you're a filmmaker, you've mm -hmm. gone to film school, mm -hmm. you're not a scientist. Mm -hmm. um, how do you do yeah. your research? How do you find these people and how do you make sure that the content in the film is there somehow? Yeah, yeah. For, for, for Mechanical Love, it was, it was kind of easy because I was traveling to see where where is the most advanced robotic uh, institute? And I wanted to, I had this working title called Mechanical Love. So I knew I wanted to go somewhere where they didn't use the technology for warfare. And the only place in the world is actually Japan. So I ended up in Japan <laughs> looking at different um, institutes and, and I met this, um, this engineer called uh, Professor Hishiguro, and the first time I met him, I just knew he was the right character because he was so staged in a way. He dressed only in black, like Ru Jules Brenner in Westworld. I don't know if you know this <laughs> 1974 film about how the, the androids take over. It's, it's, it's sort of the first film that was before the TV series Westworld. But, but he, I could see that he was sort of inspired by the evil android <laughs> in Westworld. And I, I just felt that there, there's something about the way he staged himself mm. that, uh, that worked <laughs> out really well on a film. Mm. So I just, I followed his work because he was making a perfect copy of himself and he wanted his daughter to meet this copy of himself to see how does she respond to that. Is that, is that, uh, is that something we can develop or is it just a dead idea? So that, that was sort of the, the, the A to B narrative in the film. Mm. And then in between that, I could weave other stories from other places in the world. So, so as you say, I mean, it's, 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 it's based on, it's, it's thematically driven, yeah. but it's also character driven. It's definitely character yeah. driven. I, I, you know, I, if I don't like the character, I'm not going to be able to spend so much time with these people that you do when you make a film. It's sometimes three, four, five years. So you really have to, really like the person that you're filming because mm. there's a long uh, period of filming but then there's also a long period of time where you sit and look at them in an editing room so <laughs> it has to be something that keeps you know they, they have to be interesting mm. and there have to be sort of a connection so yeah so it's it's something that's a bit abstract to how how to cast for a documentary it's not something that you can really um, you can you can go to places where it's likely that you'll meet them but it's not, uh, you can't really plan it. You can't, you can't, just because they have the right research area, it's not sure that they'll work in a film. Mm -mm. And when you talk about connection, do you mean personal connection or I mean emotional connection? I well, mean with you, so both maybe. Both actually, mm. because um, I always, when I, when I try to figure out if this is a good main character, I always try to push them a little bit to see how, how much do they accept, how, wh how do they respond if I say I'm gonna, probably be filming for the next two years. Do they go like, th that's too long, or I can't take that, or will they say, well, well that's really good because I need to tell you something, or you know, how do they respond to the method? Mm. And, uh, and what do they do when, they just, you know, when they're just at their office? Because Hiroshi Ishiguro, he just took a big thermo with espresso and he just you know, drank the whole thing. And I thought, okay, this is, th this is just interesting how this, this, he, he's not connected to his body. And you know, <laughs> it was just interesting to see how he was sort of treating his, his own body like a robot body, actually. Mm. And that whole, whole thing kept being interesting to just watch. Mm. And it had to be someone like that to make a copy of yourself mm. because he basically wants to sort of get rid of himself but keep living. <laughs> and there, there's all sorts of funny things about that whole mm. uh, way of being in the world. Mm. Maybe we could, towards the end of the seminar we could talk a bit more about relationship with characters because mm. I know that one thing that you're 
serious about is that, you know, you, you push them and you want to tell your story, you have an agenda, but you mm -hmm. always want them to feel they can recognize themselves yeah, yeah, in the film, right? Definitely. I mean, you would never, you know, no. do anything against that. So no, and I, I never make these contracts that you're really supposed to do. You're really supposed to make contracts with the character where they sign off all their rights and they have perfect trust in you and you do whatever you want with the material. <laughs> but I, I always felt that that's not how they're going to open up. Mm. So I never, I, I, they sign the contract when they've seen the finished film. But, but I never have that kind of uh, power game going on because uh, I wouldn't want to be in a film if I had you know, signed a contract like that. I wouldn't want to say things that I was insecure of or I wouldn't want, want to go so far. I mm. would stay on the safe side all the time. So it's nerve wracking when I have to show the film to the, to the characters because I have no paper. You know, nothing is sort of so other any, than anything trust, can happen. Basically, anything can happen, and it's a nightmare. But I can't figure out how to do it differently. No, that's the way. So, so the next film, and that's what we're going to show a clip mm -hmm. from, is Free the Mind. But mm -hmm. would you say a few words about the film, and then we can show the clip? Or yeah, set this, it up. Th this film is set in the in the U.S. in Wisconsin, and that was because the, here they do a lot of research on uh, Buddhist monks, how meditation affects their brains. And it came out of mechanical love that I wanted to look at what, what is a, how does a thought manifest itself in the brain and can you actually change the brain, the structure of the brain from thinking differently. And it also came out of I suffered just when I was recording mechanical love just before that I started suffering from panic attacks. Mm. So I started in this meditation group in Copenhagen and I, and I could feel that it was getting better and I was changing something. So I was also really curious to see is this something that I'm just hoping is happening or is it actually physically happening in the brain? So I, you know, usually I also have a very personal entrance to something that makes me really want to look at it because mm. I, I really wanted to know what is actually going on in the brain. So I went to the place in the world where they do the most of this um, and met the, the, the scientist there that's sort of in charge of it. And then, uh, and then I made the film. Can we see the clip from uh, Free the Mind? Some of those pictures I'll never forget. sleep every night. Without the medication, I, I've gone nights without sleeping. I don't like what I did. Um, there are practices that are designed to promote beneficial qualities in the person. Compassion meditation is a kind of meditation that we've studied extensively. And there's a region of the brain that we call the insula. And it's an area of the brain that is literally used for interacting between the mind and the body. And this area of the brain is dramatically enhanced in its activation during compassion meditation and will enable practitioners who practice compassion meditation regularly to feel the emotion of others more easily. We have found that three months of meditation practice lead to changes on certain measures of attention that reflect a person's capacity to pick up on small changes in her or his environment. A lot of our daily lives are spent in social interaction where we interact with other people and the reality is that much of that information is not conscious. We're just not aware of it. Uh, and what we find after three months of meditation practice, people are able to notice much more subtle things in their environment, which would lead people to be better at picking up on others. Uh, research indicates that emotional intelligence is a far more important ingredient in life than is um, traditional cognitive intelligence. And so 
uh, our ability to pick up on the emotions of others, to understand our own emotions, to regulate our attention, those are qualities which really can make a big difference in terms of life success. Does anyone think this is a real brain? No. 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 Uh, our real brain is not colored like this, is it? No. This is a model of a brain. The brain actually is probably the most complicated thing that exists in the whole universe. Scientists estimate that it has about 10 billion connections, which is one with um, many, many, many zeros following it. <laughs> we can feel all the different feelings that we feel because the brain is as complicated as it is. You mean like if you're feeling sad? Or are you feeling... How else might you feel? Frustrated. Frustrated. Oh, how bad. else? Bad. bad. Angry. Angry. Mm. Mm. There are different parts of the brain that become active when we have feelings of sadness and feelings of frustration and feelings of happiness. And we can change our brains for the better. And that's something that is possible for every single person. And one of the really cool things is that Laura is actually going to be teaching you some exercises which can actually help you to change your feelings. You can be happier and you can feel um, kinder toward all of your friends more easily. So the film is about <coughs> some veterans that go through, um, okay, that go through <laughs> an, uh, some breathing exercises and then these kids that, uh, where you see the, the little one, I just realized now that he looks a lot like Sammy. Yeah, gosh, from that's this right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's funny how you keep repeating sort of the same things in, <laughs> you think you're casting someone new, yeah. and you're actually recognizing someone else when in, he was maybe a child. Ah, that's so interesting. Things like that happen yeah. all the time. But anyways, the, the, this kid goes through the whole process of uh, learning to take an elevator because he suffers from severely claustrophobia, and maybe he actually also has PTSD because he's been moved from 20 homes at the age he has now. So, um, so that, that's, those experiments are being portrayed in the film. Yeah, and I, I was just wanted to say that as well. It's so difficult to choose clips because basically you just want to see the whole film. But when I chose this clip, it was because I wanted to show the tools you use. Yeah. To, 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 <coughs> because the thing is, this is also a character-driven film. Yeah. So the, re the researcher we see, he's one of the characters, the boy we see, mm -hmm. and then there's the vet, as you say. Mm -hmm. But we also, you also give us a lot of info, a yeah, lot of yeah. very technical, scientific yeah. info, yeah. and how to, do, how to balance that, how yeah. to balance the yeah. art yeah. versus the information. Could yeah. you talk a bit about that? Well, to me, it was so important in this film because when I suffered from panic attacks and I came to my doctor, at that time, nobody was saying, maybe you should try meditating. They said, here's um, some medication. And I, and I felt that I didn't want that medication. I wanted to try something else. So to me, it was so important that this film could speak to everyone. I really wanted everyone to know that there are different options. No, I'm not against medication at all. But I just, want, I, I just felt that it was so important to, uh, to give uh, people the possibility to choose. So I was... I wanted to make this film so easy to understand that even a child could understand it. So we made these children drawings and we made these scenes where, he, where, where the, this really posh scientist explains the science to children. Mm. So be, because I, I felt that th this is not the time to be sophisticated and maybe a bit snobbish or this is really mainstream knowledge that everyone needs to have access to. So, so that's why I chose these different things, and I, and I think that it's important to know that there's a science behind it. It's not just self-suggestion. It is, it is actually scientifically based, all this research. So I, sometimes I use the, the characters uh, and their dramas sort of as a Trojan horse to get some more hardcore information into the film. Because you want to see this kid, if, if, does he get on an elevator or not? So you follow his storyline. And through uh, following that, you also learn a lot about how the brain works and 
what, what you can do to calm the brain down and stuff like that. Yeah, and that's why I want to make clear that this is not representative of the film's mm. tone in yeah, a way. Yeah. This is the information that's been given, but th there's a lot of emotion in it. Yeah. When you follow the boy very closely, where he's devastated going to elevator, mm. so it's also emotionally driven mm. through the mm. characters. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's important because otherwise it would just be sort of a, a produ well produced BBC uh, or you know, Discovery Channel production. So it's, it's important still to have the personal stories in the scientific setting. And, and you've kind of made that a, a trademark. I mean, as you say, this is the, so it became a trilogy in the end, yep. where, you, where, yeah, you, where yeah. you wanted to explore science mm. in a different way, mm, mm. in a cinematic way, in an artistic way. Mm. You were even, as I understand it, in the Niels Bohr Institute, which is like yep. you know, the most famous physics institute mm, in the mm, world, mm. basically, where you were artist in residence or something. Yeah, but it's, it's also because I really think that, uh, that art has sort of a, another level of um, communicating knowledge. There is, we, we look at, we, we tend to, at least in Denmark, we tend to sort of divide knowledge. There's this sci hardcore scientific knowledge that you can measure and weigh and that we have all these instruments that can show us what's going on. But, and then we have art, but, there's a, but, but when art sort of meets science, there's a whole fourth room that opens up. That's sort of a, that there's another room for, um, for realizing how reality is so uh, complex that's, that's, that opens up that I just think is, is really interesting and also important that we, that we don't, um, that, that we keep opening up and keep being curious about what this world consists of because uh, we have a very reductionist way of looking at reality if we only look through one or the other uh, if you only look through through science in the Western way, you only look through art. So it's uh, to me, it's it's important as a documentarist to keep opening these rooms and just being curious and seeing what's what's under the stone or what's behind the wall or keep keep opening reality up because it's so much more complex than what we look at normally because mm. we we are so habitual in our minds that sometimes we only see what we expect to see. It's very difficult to see something that you have learned to look for. So that, that, that sort of carried me on to the, to the last film in the trilogy, When You Look Away, where, where, yeah, where I was at the Niels Bohr Institute because they, it, it's, it, sort of, it starts at the, the quantum physics lab. It starts when looking at a very old experiment uh, to see that wh wh where it's actually obvious that what you see is not necessarily what you think you see. And that's, uh, that's sort of the beginning of the film. And then I start exploring what, what patterns show up if I don't uh, look at them. Or if I sort of, you know, we, we, if you walk in the forest at night and there's a, you're walking at a small path, if you look ex at it, you can't see it. If you look just bes beside it, you can see it. It's something that's with a field of vision that sometimes when you, when you, when you don't look directly at what you want to see, you see it sort of <laughs> out <laughs> uh, in the side of your vision. So that, that was sort of my trick for the film, to try not look directly at the film, but to like, look next to it. It's, it sounds extremely abstract, and it is. <laughs> so I made these different rules to myself that I, that I was at Nisbo Institute, I was filming a scientist there, a quantum physics scientist, and then from there, I, I couldn't choose any other characters. From then on, I had to just go with the flow, what this person said, I think you should meet him, or I think you should meet her. And, I, and the film is cut strictly chronological. There's no time, that I'm, I'm not cheating with time in any way. We looked at the cards, the dates, everything is chronological in the film. And I'm not um, asking questions to the worldview of the, of the people in the film. So those were sort of three dogmas that I made the film from in order to see, so what happens when I don't control? What happens when I don't direct? What happens when I don't cast the characters in the film? What, what actually comes forth? So it's, it was uh, crazy to make this film, but it was also extremely interesting because I was at a time where I was the only one who would sort of pull out the rock beneath mm. my feet. And sometimes you need to do that to sort of wake up and see, okay, do something different. And you need sometimes to force yourself into completely out of your comfort zone to see uh, what, what happens then. But it's in, interesting because you, you, you talk about them as a trilogy. Mm -hmm. So mechanical love, free the mind, when you look away. Yeah. 
but there's a few years yeah, yeah, yeah. to say several years. Yeah. You make two films in the yeah, meantime yeah, yeah. before you come back to yeah. when you look away. Yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering because in, in Mechanical Love and in Free the Mind, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're looking at science, yeah. but you're also, you're also doing it from a science point of view, yeah. where in when you look away, you're kind of, you're pulling the rug out from mm. yourself as a filmmaker, yeah. but you're also questioning the science. Yeah. So did, that, did you need years and time to, to end up in that film, well, I mean, the, uh, if I could have gone to an institute where they were sort of investigating what is consciousness, then I would have done that. But but everywhere I looked, it was just only this little bit, little slice of reality. It wasn't you could because nobody knows. It's it's a question that's really still mysterious. Nobody can answer the question. So I couldn't sort of I couldn't do the same trick that I did in the other films just to go somewhere where they're doing an experiment that I can film. I couldn't do it with this subject because. Everyone who is a living being has their own version of reality. So, so uh, I, I couldn't um, make that decision. So, so it took me a long time to figure out how do I make a film where I'm not making a film? How do I sort of, it, it was really, really difficult to find the right construction. Mm. And I'm not even sure it was the right construction, but it was, it was a construction that I could lean into and sort of um, see what happened instead of forcing something to happen. It's, it's going to be shown on, on, on Tuesday, so we, we don't have a clip from it here. Yep. And I, actually, I'm glad we don't have a clip from mm -hmm. it, because I think that would be an impossible film yeah, yeah. to take a clip from almost, because as Fee says, it really is chronological, and, and excuse my French, it fucks with your mind. Yeah. I mean, once you've seen that film, you're not the same again. You understand there are structures out there that you always think is a coincidence, and maybe it's not. And it's not because it becomes mm -hmm. hocus pocus, it actually becomes something very real. Mm -hmm. And what you also decide in the film is that everyone's an expert. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, everyone, everyone you meet, every yeah. person that has an opinion and yeah. which you are brought to, so it doesn't have to be a scientist. No, and this you was start with your daughter, actually. Yeah, yeah, and this was highly provocative. When the film came out, you know, I had some uh, scientists that were like growing, they were so angry because, <laughs> I, you know, in the film, we, I have everyone there is an expert in what they're talking about. So I have, what's the word, vis a uh, uh, janitor. Yeah, there's a janitor that has quite a big part of the film and, and, <laughs> and he's an expert in his field and it was just, a, to me it was a surprise that this was so provoking to level out hierarchies, but that's how it is with you. When you look at, at reality, it's um, in my, you know, I deeply believe that we are all experts in our own fields and there, there, there's really no um, reason to put in these hierarchies. So. But, but I was a bit surprised still that, that we, um, we like hierarchies and we like that power is put in one place where this person has worked with this in a lot of years. So, and, and I respect experts. It's not that I don't respect them. I just think that there are a lot of different experts and there's also a lot of different takes on reality that we need to respect and look at. There's a wonderful moment in the film where one of these people that is an expert in their region. He has, he has invented some kind of water, I won't go into details, and they simply, in, in the Science Institute, mm. they cannot find out why it works. Mm. They know it works, but they can't find it. Yeah. And you challenge them and say something, and they say something like, well, that means we have to change all the rules of physics. That doesn't mm. work like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 and you yeah. said, why not? Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, that, that's the level of, yeah. of discourse in the yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, we always, as human beings, think that we, we are at the top of uh, evolution. We, also, we always tend to think that this is, this is peak performance, but, it's, but you know, just look two years ago when we didn't have corona. I mean, there's so much knowledge being created during a pandemic, pandemic that wasn't there before. And you know, th it's just, we, we have to be more humble mm. <laughs> towards reality. Mm. I mean, we, we have a lot of more clips and stuff to go through, but I just want to mention, if anyone has a question, please let me know, and I can easily let you in in the question. So just raise your hand, if anything. So we, we jumped a bit in time and space now, so we're mm. going to go back in time mm. to the film that you made right after... Free the Mind. It was a good thing to wait. Oh. Yeah, but actually, I want to I want to show a clip from Songs mm. from mm. the Soil yeah. first. Mm. Could you say a few words about that? Because... So you've made these films. First, they were character-driven purely. Yeah, then they yeah. turned into be more thematically, yeah, but also character-driven. Yeah, yeah. And then you're you're basically making something that's just emotion, atmosphere. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Was yeah. that was that a, like a challenge for yourself as an artist, or what? How did that film come about? Well, it was sort of I was trying to make uh, a meditation, a visual meditation, because at that time I you know I had meditated for several years, and I thought that it was. Uh, 
it would be good to make something that could uh, work as a vi visual meditation. But, um, but also because I was making a film on a biodynamic farm and biodynamics is really about how you experience reality. How, mm. do, you, how do you sort of sense reality? So I wanted to, uh, in order to finance this experiment, I was making a, a, a sort of linear A to B story about a farmer who was pressured from EU directives and had to make his own rules and stuff like that. It, actually a David and Goliath story kind of classical. But but the film that I really wanted to make was this shorter film that's, that doesn't have a narrative and that's much closer to um, the intuition you can feel when you watch something. But but that's not, you can't just uh, say this is the film I want to make and then finance that. That's because it's difficult to distribute it. It's In its original form it's performed with a choir in front of uh, the, the screen. Uh, you'll see it here with the recording of the choir, but to me, it's just uh, it was just so pleasurable to make something where everyone had their own uh, experience of seeing it mm. because there's there isn't a narrative in it, and also when it's live performed, I feel that I'm the audience because the choir that's in front of the screen they are the one performing, not not the film. Mm. So it's also sort of a relieving to sort of put the responsibility on someone else. So mm. it's, a, it's a great pleasure to make something in collaboration with others. Mm. So let's see the clip from Songs from the Soil.
know, maybe I should say that <coughs> one of the reasons why I, I made this film was also because this was uh, almost 10 years ago I started recording it, and this was um, when I became a climate activist. <laughs> so I decided not to fly anymore. So I only wanted to make films that were in locations I could get to by train or, you know, by driving or something like that. And also, when I, when, I, when I made the film at this location, I felt like I was looking at, at something that could very likely be a paradise lost. Mm -hmm. It was the beginning of the... We were beginning to know more about the biodiversity crisis and the sixth mass extinction that we're witnessing now. So I felt that now that I'm here, I really need to extract everything, everything from this place, because in a year or two, it might not be there anymore. It could be an industrial farmer that would take it over and the whole ecosystem would change in this place. So I was sort of, I was just, I had the feeling that this is now. I need to grasp everything I can now. And I made two films in one location because um, it was, it felt urgent. Uh, this guy is really, really old, so it's still there. <laughs> it wasn't as urgent as I thought. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the, the, the climate crisis is uh, serious and the biodiversity crisis is really serious too. Yeah, because that, that was my, my initial question would be, I mean, so going local, what triggered that? So was, was it, what came first, the egg or the hen, so to speak? Was it your choice to make the film that we're going to see a clip from in a moment, yeah. good things away <coughs> from the farm, that made you conscious about the mm. climate? Or was that something that came before? I mean, where, where well, did it start? Actually, it's, it's kind of strange, but when I went to the US to do this film and meditation, I felt pretty stressed out because it was so stressful to film in this location because I never knew when I was going to get kicked out because in the US they have these uh, strict rules about what, to docu what you can actually document. They send people to war with no preparation, more or less, but when they <laughs> came back, they're very worried that about these people, what, what, what would we see from these war veterans. There's a lot of war veterans in the film. Uh, so oh, I didn't know, I, I mean, when they started their, their course in the institute, all these veterans, I hadn't met them. I couldn't reach out to them before they came. So I didn't know if even one of them was going to be in the film. So th there was, it was such a risky film to make. And I had taken my whole family there because I, when I shoot, I always bring my kids and my husband <laughs> because otherwise if, if, I'm, if I'm gone too long it's too painful. Mm. So it was sort of a high risk project in that way. So when, when I finished it I felt now I really need to just calm down and just see something that's moving really slowly and feel the soil under my feet and really sort of ground myself. And, and then I, made, I started making the film on the biodynamic farm and then I could all, then all these realizations just started to happen mm. that I had also been part of this accelerating uh, lifestyle where you have to produce, produce, and it has to be foreign language, it has to be bigger and better. And you know, I, I was in this wheel and I was in there voluntarily. Mm. So I could also step out of it. So that's, that's sort of, I chose to step out of it. And when I stepped out, all these, um, you know, there was space for other kinds of thoughts. So uh, the experience that I had was that, you know, when you, when you put a macro optic on your camera, there's a whole world that opens. You don't need to travel. You can just look, look at the world through a macro lens and there's things that you have never seen before that is right under your feet. Mm. So to me, it was sort of, um, yeah, it became a dogma to try and uh, explore the world that's just around me instead of going out. Mm. Because, you know, we were also talking about the other day, to, it's easy to go to India. There's a film, just when you step out in Delhi, there's a film. Mm. And, and you have to sort of sharpen your pencil a little bit more to see the films that's just around you. Mm. But it's also really rewarding. Mm. So, so, yeah, so that realization came as a reaction to having made Free the Mind under very stressful conditions. So stressed after making a film about meditation, which is exactly, a, a exactly. paradox yeah, yeah, and oxymoron. Yeah. Med that's just the way it is. Meditating and being fucked up, stressed out. It exactly. Was well, maybe maybe as you're talking about it, maybe you should see the clip already now from Good Things Await, so mm -hmm. we can see what kind of film you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. You want to say a few words about it before the clip? You said it was a biodynamic, uh, bi biodynamic farm, farm yeah. but it's also a farm that, that as a, is, is kind of part of the, of the elite cooking, I mean, gastro yeah, yeah. scene in Denmark yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's also an interesting contrast. Yeah. Very old man, very old farm. Yeah. But what he's making is so exclusive yeah. that they come. I want, just want to say that because that's part of the 
of, of the, the clip. clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, let's see good yeah. things away. Yeah, du kan da lige på din kant, den er kommet nu, ja. Din kant er kommet nu. Det er jo ligesom for mig til at gøre min handling, det er velovervejet ting, som øh, vi kan, når vi er udvokset, når vi har et, et bevidst jeg. Og mit jeg har boet inde i mig. Det føler jeg også, at det træffer mine beslutninger øh, et sted øh, indefra. Og det er den store forskel på for os og så øh, husdyrene her, især koen. De får deres med det, som man skal gøre udefra. Så når jeg kan se, at, at de reagerer som flokke, så er der sådan noget, der påvirker dem udefra. Og det har de det bedste med. Og derfor må jeg jo ligesom lære at, at forstå, hvordan er det så, at det her mjordelige gruppe jeg, det virker på den. Så det er at jeg kan komme til at, at lære noget af det gruppe jeg og behandle køren ligesom en gruppe, jeg gør. Ikke bare, at jeg føler mig forbundet med dem, men jeg ser, at de, de svarer igen ved at føle sig forbundet med mig. Og, og det er så det, der giver nogle sjældne fuldende at have oplevelser ved at føle, at, at de der store gruppe, jeg er, de også kan lige at komme i kontakt med os. Det er ikke bare os, der skal arbejde på at komme i kontakt med dem, men de vil hellere end gerne være komme i kontakt med os. Det længeste de faktisk efter, det kan jeg mærke. The, the pig vi brought you for to weeks ago was almost a, a little bigger than this one there. That was fantastic. We had we had it for a, a big a big staff dinner actually. Yeah, yeah, because it was all cut up at that, so we just had it all prepared and we had 60 of us sat down on it. It was fantastic. That's nice. You see, there's some a lot of, of meat here. Yeah. I don't want to talk about this while he's here. I was here. gonna say, I feel bad though. Yeah, this bit looks delicious. <laughs> oh, it smells fantastic. The flowers are wonderful. Yeah. There you see again this uh, uh, flower called Rölige. It's like a, a parabolic instrument for absorbing the rays from the universe. Yeah. As a human being, I feel completely independent of what's happening out in the star world. But the plants, they don't. Yeah. They are really attached to this, what's going on out there. We have to study that, we have to measure that to get the best from the universe into the plant world. And then we get a, an optimal plant substances, so we as humans indirectly get the good strength from the universe. But we get it through the food we eat, and the food has to be healthy, and the food is in connection with the sun. The dandelion opens up when it's sunshine, when it's raining, it keeps close. There's really a connection between the sun and the dandelion yeah. flower. Jorden har os brødet givet, solen har det skænke livet. Det er så kære jord, takken i vort hjerte bor. Velsignet være mand. And what are the rest of the farms in the, in the northern part here? They're not all biodynamic. No. And what do they think of what you do? Do you try and convince them to change their ways? No. I don't try to convince, not even the Louis and, and Sian, I try to convince about anything. They have to find out themselves. Mm -hmm. They have the confidence that biodynamic farming is not something from the past, it's something for the future. And the future might come tomorrow, it might come in 100 years or so, but we have to prepare it. Yeah. Because it's, what we're doing is all truth, and uh, you cannot uh, avoid the truth to, to come into existence sooner or later. So you're just helping it along? Yes, yeah, so we built up on, on this sort of, of uh, relationship between all different sort of plants and animals and so in nature. And uh, to, to study that more and more and take care of that and use that, and then it, it can't go wrong. It's the best thing you can do. The future is on our side, that's for sure.
I'm no doubt about that. <laughs> I will admit it, I'm in love with Nils Stockholm. I think he's <laughs> so fantastic. And I want to show this clip because he's a philosopher. I mean, he knows something, what he's doing. He understands the, I mean, he's not just a hobby pharmacist. I mean, he, he knows exactly what he's doing with the biodynamics mm. and, and, the, and the philosophy behind it. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's so funny when he's in the stable looking at, there's so much meat here because he never even tasted meat. And neither did his parents. So he's, he's just sort of selling, <laughs> selling, talking about the meat and stuff. But he never, he, he's a second generation uh, vegetarian, which is kind of rare for his generation. Plus, it's interesting because one of the things he wants to do is, is to, to preserve the, the, the type of cattle that yeah, he has yeah. on his farm because it's something that could be distinct otherwise, right? Extinct. Yeah, but, but, but if, if he could avoid selling it, he would just let them live and die naturally because he's actually. He is farming for the soil. Mm -hmm. He's building up the hummus layer, so he doesn't. Uh, he, if he could afford it, he wouldn't, uh, you know, sell the the cattle. So, so, it's, so it's, it's, it's a different it's way of farming. It's, it's a different, a diff way. It's a different yeah. way of farming. Actually, the clip I initially wanted to show, which is one of my favorite moments in the film, is in the beginning, mm -hmm. where a calf. They're helping a calf uh, come out, and and he kind of scolds you, Nils, and said, "Put put down the camera and come and help me." <laughs> kind of. So you had to pull out the yeah. calf and help him. So, so that kind of brings me again to the relationships you have with your, with your characters. Yeah. I mean, one thing is, how did you know about the place? How did you found it? But also how you built up this relationship with, with your characters. Well, it, as it was with, uh, well, uh, one thing I have to say now is that I feel guilty that I have so many male characters that in my, my films. That was my next question. Yes, exactly. because that is kind of obvious. <laughs> and I, I tried to change that. And it, did it work in, in, uh, in seven, in, in uh, 70-30 it's different and in what was before that in rediscovery is different yeah i changed it but it's not <laughs> easy because a lot of times these people just come forth and they and you can see that this is this is a character and you have to be uh, aware that there's maybe another character standing behind that so that's what i'm sort of sharpening my eye towards mm. anyways uh, with Nils, uh, he was like, we, we, uh, uh, when, I, when I met him the first time, it was the same with Hiroshi Ishiguro, that, that I, the, the things he said was just so, I mean, there was a, I was in an um, excursion with my youngest daughter, she was in kindergarten, and they went to visit this farm, mm. and one of the parents asked Nils, so uh, how much milk do you produce? And Nils was like, I don't produce anything, I receive what the cow wants to give me. And I thought, okay, this is another way of farming that I need to explore a bit because uh, this is just turning, you know, flipping the coin completely. Mm. So, uh, so I talked to him about the process of making this film, and I said, well, I will, I will be following you maybe a year. That would be if I want all four seasons. And he says, well, I think you should do three years. <laughs> and then I knew that this is, we have sort of the right. Uh, way of, of working together, that, mm. that he's not going to get uh, tired of me mm. if I spend, and I, and I did spend two and a half years there. So, and, and also Nils used to say, well, we have a karmic uh, condition together, so you, you have to make this film. Mm. So there's also some, you know, sometimes there's a, it's not so rational. <laughs> no, and, and in, the, in that sense, it's kind of connected to your other films, and then, yeah. you know, uh, when you look away, that comes after this yeah, film, yeah, yeah. it kind of build, builds up to that, yeah, yeah, yeah. doesn't it? But I think you, uh, if you could mention, because people can't see the film while they're here, you know, it, the, the interesting thing is, so, so you're, you're showing a film uh, about something that, of course, looks like paradise, and it's wonderful, mm. but there's also a conflict going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, he is actually in opposition to what we, normally would think is the good guys, mm. the people doing ecological yeah. farming, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, there's, there's, yeah. there's an interesting contrast there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because uh, a lot of the times we, we base our trust in these big EU systems and the labels and stuff like that, but the truth is that it's not, it's not that simple, that you can actually be someone who's farming without pesticides or anything, but it's really difficult to get this ecological label because one, one thing that he had a pig with only three legs and that took away his eco label so you know there's there's strange rules that we don't know of because they are really complicated so the film is about you know getting back to m more of a, a farming according to the animals instincts and the animals instincts are not considered in the EU rules mm -hmm. not even not for organic farming it's still monoculture and it's still cattle in big uh, stables and they only get out 120 
years, uh, days a year, and that means that if you are um, a bull uh, cat, you, you're not going to get out at all. So mm. there's there's a lot of bullshit around those labels actually. Exactly. So th you you just need to check out w if you want to eat meat. You, in my opinion, you need to check out who's producing it. You need to visit the farm because the 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 eco lab label is not enough. Mm -mm. Are there any comments or questions? Because otherwise, I, I would like to ask you, Fee, um, because you we can go back to before you introduced with Songs from the Soil, we talked about working with other artists, working with other creative people. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a bit about that? I mean, like how you find your inspiration working with others or how you, how you collaborate with other artists and how that if affects the way you make your films or you create your art? Mm. Yeah, I, I haven't done it a lot. You know, I usually direct myself, but right now I'm developing a project where I'm hoping to work with other Nordic uh, directors that we make a film about how to... It's a film about climate change in the Nordic countries. And usually we think about that this is something that's going to happen in the global south and, and we're going to be fine in the north because we have all this good infrastructure and we're rich and stuff like that, but it is happening now in the north. So I'm working with a scientist that contacted me to say, do you want to make a film about how do, we, how do we prevent these catastrophes? Because that's what we are looking at now. We're not looking at trying to, to keep below the one and a half degree that, that uh, that's actually too late. So we need to look at how do we secure places where people are in danger in the north. And that project, I think, is actually um, the perfect way of making that is to put it on different uh, shoulders. Mm. So there's a director in each country that sort of makes the story in one director in Iceland, one in Finland. So, so we carry it together mm. because it, you know, going through climate crisis is a collaborative. We need to to help. If you know, everyone has to sort of uh, chip in. So, uh, so I'm 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 uh, working on a project that's hopefully going to be a prism where we sort of share the same uh, cinematographer. I think. That's going to be the solution, and then there's a different director for for each, each story. Yeah. When we talked about this this seminar with you originally, we talked about I mean at least a lot of the things we talked about the last year is how do you make a film in these times of Corona? Yeah, what yeah. have we learned from Corona? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I would yeah, keep yeah. on saying, well, Fee actually made sustainable films before Corona because yeah. you didn't travel. Yeah, you, yeah. you decided not to fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Years ago. Yeah. But I I think it's interesting to think about. So one thing is what you do to survive or, yeah. or to 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 react to a situation. Mm -hmm. Another thing is how it can actually become something positive for your creative work. Yeah, and I, I think it it yeah. is really possible uh, and and to do something that you wouldn't um, that you wouldn't think of otherwise. Mm. So it's it's always about seeing the challenge as something that can make me develop your film language instead of um, contract it because. You know, what I hear a lot from artists is that I don't want, I want my artistic freedom, but there's no such thing as artistic freedom. We're always restricted by money or geography or, you know, there, there are all sorts of restrictions. We are just used to them. So we, we just don't see them. Mm. So the, the ultimate artistic freedom, I think, is, is sort of an illusion. We're always working inside different frames. So this is just a new kind of frame to work within. And you can do it in, in all diff kinds of ways. Mm. In continuation of that, I mean, talking about working with others. So the film you'll be screening tomorrow, your latest film, mm -hmm. 7030, yeah. um, which was made in Denmark, mm -hmm. a Danish subject. You were there. But nevertheless, you did choose to work with some very young cinematographers, mm -hmm. which you thought, as I understand it, could add something to your storytelling. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I, I had some. Um, uh, female cinematographers that went out to the demos and did uh, a lot of shootings uh, at the because the film is about the climate election in Denmark that sort of results in a, a climate act in Denmark the that was in two, was it in 19 or 20 I don't remember 19 I think yeah 19, yeah. yeah and the, the film follows the political process seen through the activists eye and uh, the politicians eyes so I, I had the other photographers going out into the streets doing these uh, demonstrations, uh, which was a, a relief to me. And also they came with something that I couldn't have gotten. Mm. So it's, um, but, but you know, this is something a lot of people do because it's just strange that I keep the camera to myself. <laughs> so, so I guess that you could find examples of others that are much more extreme with letting uh, 
other people take responsibility of the visuals. But to me, it's been it's always been since family. It's been important for me to to have the camera mm. because this is how I understand reality. Mm. I understand reality seen through the lens. I don't. Uh, I can't really grasp it unless I see through a camera. Mm. So, so it's not just a practical thing, it's sort of an ex existential thing. If, if, if I don't film something regularly, I have nightmares. I wake up with nightmares that I can't, I can't there's something I can't see or I can't understand or mm. I get these stress nightmares. So it's, to me, it's actually sort of a, a way of understanding the world that you can, you look through the lens and then you decide what to look at. You don't see the whole thing. You decide, and maybe you zoom in, and maybe you, you make a, a whole different framing. But it's a way of being in this world. So, so I can't let go of it completely. Mm -mm. But I also mentioned it because in the beginning, you also said something about that you hoped that you would redefine yourself on the way. I ask you, so was your cinematic language kind of you know, set and done mm. in film mm. school? And, mm. and of course, you change on the way. But there's something about redefining the way you work, yeah. which you did with When You Look Away, mm. where you kind of challenge yourself in the way you built the story yeah. and also the content. Mm. And, and then you choose to work with other younger artists mm. that, can, mm. that can give something else. I'm just mm. wondering about this thing about redefining yourself mm. along the road and how you make sure to keep your eyes fresh and do something new. Yeah, but every what, time. Yeah, I think what you know, what would be the perfect uh, future for me was actually to work with a much more diverse group of people, because that is something we need more diversity in the storytelling. So uh, to me, it's important that I don't go to Japan to make a story about a Japanese uh, scientist, but I could work with a Japanese director that did that story and sort of all these kinds of. Um, uh, nuances that come into a film if someone who has a very strong connection to that place makes it instead of, you know, to me, I, I see myself as sort of, I've been a bit like a tourist, just traveling around, seeing whatever comes to mind and filming it. Mm. But there, there are so many m more layers that I can see mm. because I'm just a tourist. So I, I think what's, what I'm really curious about and what I feel is incredibly important is to get a much more diverse, uh, group of storytellers. Mm. Yeah, and continuously. I mean, th it's, it's such an inter interesting thing that once you see something or you open a door, it's also impossible to close it. Yeah. So as you say, when you look at the clips of your films mm. now, you see all the men, you're mm. thinking, mm. oh my god, yeah, you know, yeah. I need to do something about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And it goes for, uh, for you, it's climate and mm. everything, but mm. it also goes for, and you were mentioning that when we were talking about which stories are yours yeah. to tell yeah. and which are not. Yeah, yeah, because then uh, the other day I thought, I want to make a film about this woman who made, uh, who, who's making, uh, she's a lawyer and she's working with hate crimes. But then I thought, but that's, it's not my film to make. It's someone else who has to make that film. Mm. A colored person has to make, the, make that film. Yeah. So to me, it's, uh, it's, ju it's just, uh, I, I really like it when I get these, um, you know, when I realize that now you need to find, you need to find another story or you need to go somewhere else because it's also, uh, it, it triggers you. So. Mm. Um, some people get provoked, but I think that it's good to provoke yourself from time to time. Yeah, and sometimes limitations can yeah. actually bring yeah. something good mm. with them, a new way of thinking. I just want to make sure I keep an eye on because we don't have that much time left if anyone to. So remember to, to think about questions or ask them while we're here. So we're going to go to the, well, we have like 10, 15 minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> The thing about Yufi is that you you don't just you know you don't just talk you 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 walk the talk or talk the walk whatever you <laughs> say you do something about it and before we show the final clip I have mm. in store um, you even started a school yeah uh, you decided that you know instead of just being frustrated about the way people do it or thinking mm. that education could be something else yeah let's do it ourselves yeah yeah can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that yeah but that was actually when I was filming uh, the farming the farmer. I thought that there's, there's so much that kids in the school system are not um, being exposed to. That's a lot to do with how big ecosystems work together and seeing the whole thing from a much, you know, learning history uh, in Danish schools is like you, you learn it from when mankind entered planet Earth, but we need to learn history from when the, the beginning of the universe. We need to, you know, we need to look at ourselves as just a little bit a little piece in the big puzzle that's the ecosystem and stuff like that. And, and to me, it was incredibly difficult to change that within an existing system. So 
I decided with a group of other people to start a, a school from scratch. So we have a school now that's working from, you know, uh, it's a preschool, preschool till ninth grade, and the the, the third um, gang. Uh, year class, yeah. yeah, yeah, just oh, just they just graduated. They, they graduated, yeah. Oh, so, so it's been for that long. When did it start? Yeah, but it's because we started from uh, preschool to fifth grade because I had two daughters that needed to go <laughs> into the school <laughs> and the one was older. Yeah. So we, we 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 didn't start only from from preschool. So so it, it wasn't just about what they were what they were taught in in the so to speak normal schools, but it was also the way they were yeah, taught, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, the yeah. way you would approach yeah. the learning process. Yeah, yeah. They, they they need to do have much more craft and arts mm -hmm. and it, again to understand. Uh, that knowledge is not something that we just push into people. It's something that we need to experience with our bodies and with joy. Mm. You know, so so th it, there has to be a lot of play and joy, if we so, so we can remember what we learn. Mm. And I didn't see that play out so well in the school system. So sometimes it's even though it's a lot of work and it has been hard. And I'm glad that I'm sort of I step back as chairperson mm. of the board this spring and I'm happy to be out <laughs> because I've been there for eight years. But it's it's it, it's easier to make the change than to just keep looking at something that's that's dysfunctional. Mm. Especially when you invest your kids and you see other kids being, you know, suffering from mm. this limited way of looking at learning. Exactly. So talk about keeping it close to home. You made a film called Rediscovery, which mm -hmm. is about a, 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 a it wasn't about the whole school system and everything, but about a moment, yeah. about a few, some weeks where these kids were trying to explore another yeah. way of, yeah. of learning. Mm -hmm. Let's see the final clip from mm -hmm. uh, Rediscovery, please. Altså, jeg synes, at vi skal lave en regel med, at hvis man skal ligesom behandle andre, som man også, altså man skal behandle andres ting som ens egen ting, også man vil have behandlet. Ja, ja, men alligevel, man skal lige tænke over, hvis jeg gør det her, vil de blive glade for det? Eller ikke sådan glade, men vil de blive sur over det? Ja, ja, men altså, sådan at man hele tiden tænker over, er det her over gevind eller ej? Nu siger jeg ikke, fordi det, der er også andre end dem, der er her, som har... Der er mange, der har fået en eller anden idé om, at øh, hvis vi har bygget en hule, så må alle være derinde. Og det er sådan lidt irriterende. Alle være derinde? Altså alle... Nå, ja. Det er der mange, der har fået en idé om, at alle må være inde i den hul, som nogen har bygget. Og det, og det, med, det er sådan ret irriterende. Man har bygget hul for at kunne være et andet sted. Okay, okay. Øh, Nicolai, ja, har jeg allerede også noget at sige. Ja. Ja. Jeg, jeg, jeg kommer bare til at tænke på, at I har en aftale om, at man ikke skal gøre nogen kede af det. Er det ikke rigtigt? Jo. Hvis nu... Hvis nu, at... Nå, nå, det var lidt det der med at tænke sig om i forhold til de ting, I, I har snakket om, I gerne vil have, at samfundet skal indeholde. Blandt andet det der med, at vi ikke skal gøre hinanden kede af det. Hvis nu, at der kommer fire nomader hen til Konrad og gerne vil ind i hulen, og Konrad siger, dig og dig, I må komme ind, men I to, I må ikke komme ind. Gør man så nogen kede af det, og er det så i orden? Øh, jeg synes, man må ikke give ret, nogen ret til noget og sige, at andre ikke må... Det skal være lige ret. Det skal være, altså, det skal være lige ret. Men det kan godt være, at der er en, som vil godt være en bygge, hvis hun ikke er tænd, og så er der en anden bygge, fordi det er sindssygt at tænde. Og hvad tænker du i forhold til det, jeg sagde med, at hvis man gør nogen ked af det? Er det så, at... Er jeg det, ved det, jeg ikke, jeg er mere irriterende. Jeg ved det ikke, jeg sagde det godt. Men det er jo... Jamen prøv at tænke, tænk, hvad tænker du scenariet, hvis det nu skete, og du så en blive ked af det? Øh, tænker du, at det, det må man leve med, at det er sådan, reglen er? Ja. Selvom der er en, der bliver ked af det. Det er, du må sige lige, hvad du vil. Her ja. må man sige lige, hvad du vil. Eller det kommer an på, hvem det var, der blev ked af det. <laughs> så, så du tænker, at der er nogen, dem er, de er så irriterende, så det Nej, gør ikke noget, de bliver ked af det? Nej, det kan godt være, at der er nogen, jeg ikke så rigtig sådan, kender så godt. Så det er sådan, altså, for eksempel, hvis, hvis du nu siger, at Adam har blivet ked af det, og en eller anden person, som jeg bare sådan har set med, det kan jeg tro ikke med, så vil jeg nok, så vil jeg nok mere gå over til Adam, end jeg vil gå over til den anden person. Okay. Jeg synes, at vi skal undgå, øhm, hvad skal man kalde det, vold med pinden, fordi det kan gøre rigtig ondt. Øhm, det er noget andet, hvis man slår. Altså, det kan jo også gøre ondt, men det der med pinden, det kan man ikke altid styre. 
Øhm, og jeg synes, man skal i hvert fald lade være med at bruge øhm, skarpe pinde eller spidse pinde ja, til at slå pinde. med. Og så skal man, man må øh, ikke kaste pinde, der er tykkere end sådan her. Ind i huler. Ja, små ja. Og så må og man ikke, fordi at... folk okay. skal være ja. men, altså, Og man må ikke slå folk hårdt i hovedet. Men, men, nej, og det tror jeg ikke. Det tror jeg I thrive when my streams are curvy and my forests are wild. I am at my most beautiful and generous when I have room for every kind of animal and plant. I unfold and create harmonious cycles when you let me. Perhaps you are like that too? So that is, I mean, it's, it's, it's in the city. It's yeah, a yeah. patch yeah. of, of yeah. green wilderness in the city where the yeah. kids were for how many weeks? This was an experiment where the oldest kids were there for 10 weeks uh, on a row where they, they, they didn't go inside to have any kind of um, uh, teachings. They, they were only outside. So, um, it, and this was because this was a sort of a, a forgotten space where they could stay. Right now there's asphalt all over. Mm. It's, in, in, uh, in Copenhagen, we have 14% less nature than we had in 2016 now, wow. because these little spots, they keep being uh, you know, destroyed. So or built on, yeah. 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 But it was interesting, because I remember when you, when you started, I mean, your school is called the Green School, mm -hmm. and uh, there's certainly a focus towards understanding nature and being yeah, part yeah, of nature yeah, and all yeah. that. But when you made the film, I remember, when, or when you were pitching it and, and planning it, it, it comments you got were something like, you know, it, it's, it's the opposite of Lord of the Rings because mm. what happens was these kids were supposed to do things themselves, as we see an example of here, even yeah. though there is a teacher, yeah. and they do solve it. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, everything works yeah. out fine and everything, yeah, yeah. it's total harmony in the end. Yeah, they don't yeah. kill I each mean, other. There, there are so many conflicts that kids can solve by themselves, but we just, we mess the process up by going in and trying to fix it. Exactly. So the, the, the difficult thing for the grown-ups there was to actually stay out of the conflicts and just let the kids solve it themselves. But, when, when, but then in the edit, if I'm not remembering wrong, you noticed that a lot of the material was pointed towards nature. Mm -hmm. So in the end, it kind of became us and nature story, right? Mm. I mean, is this like a theme for you? You wanted, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, you, yeah. you yeah. hadn't thought about it when you did it, yeah. but you were, you were filming nature all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But that's, that tends to happen. It's, it's something when, when I shoot myself, I, sometimes the camera <laughs> does something that I'm not completely aware of. So it, it does become a story about the human relation to nature. Mm. So that's that the voice that you heard speaking is actually one of the great, great old uh, women in Denmark for Green Transitions called uh, Jude Ebelstrøm. Uh, she's speaking the film and she's sort of mother nature mm. that talks about all the connections between the children's place and how the nature plays out and how they make territories and stuff like that. And you make beautiful bridges where, where you can see how, as you say, how they make the territories, but nature does the same. Yeah, I mean, how, yeah. we, <coughs> how we mirror uh, nature in a way, but still work against it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're literally like soon out of time. Any questions or comments? Otherwise, I have a final one for Fifa, please. 
Anyone? Great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, I just have a question for like, like the last time we just talked about now, like when you're, it's a school that you have created mm. and you have started mm. and you're on board. And if you're making a documentary about this school, like how yeah. do you, um, then it's like, I mean, uh, if, you, if you think about, um, and when you talk about how you sort of, look through the lens to see reality and what is reality, but at the same yeah. time it's like, it's your space, you yeah, created yeah. it, yeah. and it's your philosophy, so yeah, yeah. how, it's like yeah. no outside view in a way, yeah. like how do you balance that? Yeah, out? well, well actually, actually I, I waited for a moment in the school's um, development phase where someone else was taking over and doing a project, doing an experiment that I, that I hadn't invented, that I wasn't part of, so when I came to the building space, I was an, on scratch like the others. So, but of course you're right that I'm part of the main architecture of the film, but I knew that I couldn't film uh, things that I had been part of uh, inventing. So, so I stayed out of, uh, you know, I stayed out of the teacher's space when they did that uh, project and just came there to film. Because it's also important that they don't, that the teachers don't feel this is like the chairperson of the board that's looking over my shoulder every day I go to work. So it, 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 it was a fine balance, but uh, I focused mainly on the kids and I, I came there only when they were in school and, uh, and, and the project wasn't mine, I, I didn't invent it. So as it developed, I didn't know what was gonna happen. I didn't know how, how far are they gonna go? Are they gonna stop the kids or are they gonna let them sort of play out their conflicts? Uh, it was important to me that I, that I didn't know what was gonna hap happen next week or what, how are they gonna intervene? So that was how I tried to sort of find the balance. Any other comments, questions? No? So when we started, when we had our talk actually, um, and also when you started, you call yourself an activist. I mean, you are a climate activist, <laughs> but we, we agreed in the beginning of this talk and when we talked earlier, this is gonna be about the art mm -hmm. and your way of mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. But you, you used a word called artistic obligation mm. uh, when we talked together and you said something that, you know, even though you wanna focus on art, you still feel obligated yeah, to make yeah, something yeah. about what's happening in the world right now. Could yeah. you just give us some closing words about how, you're, how you well, think about it, that? It was just, I, I really wanted to make sort of an, an intimate drama now. I really wanted to make something that was more like, you know, something that had nothing to do with